My name is Robert Marcus, I'm a consultant haematologist in London and I've come to the Society of Haematological Oncology, the SOHO meeting in Houston, and on Saturday morning I'm going to discuss briefly unanswered questions in indolent lymphoma. I'm going to focus in that brief talk on follicular lymphoma and ask how we manage this condition now and are there particular lessons we've learnt from recently published data and what questions is open for the future. I think we can divide follicular lymphoma into three main categories. The first is localised disease, the second is asymptomatic advanced stage disease, and the third is symptomatic advanced stage disease. So has anything happened over the last year or so which has made us change our management approach? And I think certainly in limited stage disease, the publication of the Tasmanian Australian data, which randomised patients between radiotherapy and radiotherapy plus CVP or RCVP, demonstrating that combined modality therapy gave rise to longer progression-free survival should lead to a change in practice. Well, whether or not you need to use combination chemotherapy or rituximab alone with radiation is uncertain, but the data strongly suggest that combined modality therapy improves progression-free survival in low-grade lymphoma, follicular lymphoma, stage 1 and 2. The second question, I suppose, is does that really apply to all patients with limited stage disease or only with stage 2? And Jessica Brady uh, presented at the ICML meeting a couple of years ago and published more recently PET-defined patients who are either stage 1 or stage 2, and there, radiotherapy alone for PET stage 1 disease gave rise to very good results. So I think in conclusion, for limited stage follicular lymphoma, I think we can say that combined modality therapy for stage 2 disease should be considered standard of care because progression-free survival is considerably prolonged by that approach, as is the risk of transformation into high-grade lymphoma. The second uh, question relates to um, asymptomatic advanced stage disease and is there any reason to treat these patients now? Uh, just because we have comparatively non-toxic treatment doesn't necessarily mean that there's evidence that we prolong survival or reduce the risk of transformation in such patients. And all the data now are actually three years old. Dr. Loretta Nastopil published in the British Journal of Hematology um, three years ago evidence that there's no advantage even in the antibody era in treating patients with asymptomatic disease. And I was always taught there's only two reasons to treat cancer. Does it make you live longer or feel better? And if it does neither of these things, there's no point doing it. Now I know there are those who would prefer to treat patients uh, with asymptomatic disease because of concerns about what this might do over the years. But once again, there isn't any evidence that such treatment reduces transformation risk. And just as we do with MGUS or asymptomatic CLL, I think it's entirely legitimate still to offer patients an observational policy when you have asymptomatic advanced stage disease. And I don't believe anything has changed there. For symptomatic advanced stage disease, there's little doubt that the addition of rituximab to chemotherapy, whatever you believe standard chemotherapy should be, has significantly prolonged progression-free, but also overall survival. Are there certain live questions here? Well, I think there probably are. First of all, is there evidence that any one chemotherapy is better than another? And the data from Matthias Rummel and the Steele group strongly suggested that bendamustine in those patients who tolerate it yields better results than patients who receive CHOP and by implication probably better than CVP. So in the patients who are fit enough uh, with fewer comorbidities and not at major risk of infection, I think bendamustine should be considered as our first choice chemotherapy for patients with follicular lymphoma in combination with an anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody. The second question is, should we use maintenance? The updated PRIMA data strongly suggest that progression-free but not overall survival, interestingly, is significantly improved uh, by the use of maintenance rituximab. And the BRIGHT trial, which looked at maintenance rituximab after bendamustine, once again demonstrated an improvement in freedom from recurrence, the progression-free survival advantage in patients who receive bendamustine plus rituximab, followed by rituximab maintenance. So I think the question of maintenance therapy is answered. I think patients should receive maintenance therapy after induction. And the other question, which seemed to be outstanding, is whether or not patients should receive maintenance if they achieve a PET-negative remission.
Now, I know we await the results of the Petraea trial, which has started in the UK and Australia, but the data from the FOLV12 trial from the Italian group is persuasive, and one of the randomizations there was between maintenance therapy and no maintenance in patients who are PET negative after induction, and again, there is a progression-free survival advantage in those patients who receive maintenance treatment, even if they become PET negative. So I would say that bendamustine is probably your best chemotherapy drug, and that maintenance therapy after induction, even in those patients who achieve remission, in induces a significant progression-free survival advantage. The next question is which antibody to use, and as you probably know, we published the Gallium trial a couple of years ago, which did demonstrate an advantage of abinutuzumab in combination either with bendamustine, CHOP, or CVP, in compared to rituximab in patients with follicular lymphoma, and there is a significant and definite progression-free survival advantage in those patients who receive abinutuzumab, higher PET-negative remission rate, and a lower POD24 and POD12 uh, association, so fewer patients progressing at 12 and 24 months. So I would say, based on our own data and on the data from others, that the combination of bendamustine with abinutuzumab for those patients who tolerate it gives the best results, followed by maintenance therapy. What about chemotherapy-free approaches? The RELEVANCE trial, which randomized patients between rituximab lenalidomide and rituximab chemotherapy with both arms receiving maintenance, demonstrate an equivalence between the two arms. It's unlikely, given the numbers involved, that lenalidomide rituximab is inferior to chemotherapy plus rituximab, but we haven't proved its superiority. So my own practice would be to, or my own advice would be to continue with an antibody plus chemotherapy followed by maintenance, except perhaps in those patients too frail to receive chemotherapy where one could consider lenalidomide if they'll tolerate it. What about the questions which we haven't covered and we haven't answered, and that is the group of patients who don't get a good response. Median progression-free survival is now almost 10 years, but 15 to 20 percent of patients will still progress within 24 months, and those patients have an extremely poor prognosis. You can't rescue early relapses with intensive therapy or with stem cell transplantation. So I think we need to identify that group. We've got the M7 Flippy. I think we've got the 23 gene um, uh, analysis, which has been published by the French group. And we're going to do an analysis in, in the Gallium trial to see if it still holds there as well. And we may be able to identify those patients at the beginning who have a poor prognosis and offer them experimental therapies rather than subject them to chemotherapy, which we think will not have a big significant impact on their survival. We may be able to assess those patients early as well. I think waiting for 24 months is far too long. Six months is when we can assess by PET, and those patients who don't have a PET negative remission fall into worse prognostic group. And we also have some preliminary data on circulating tumour or cell-free DNA, which suggests that the absence of disappearance of cell-free DNA is associated with a poor prognosis, and we may be able, therefore, to pull patients out of standard therapy at that point and offer them some experimental treatment.